Immunity has been on everyone's lips since the pandemic began. Now it's more pressing than ever as infections rapidly rise in parts. Immunity depends on antibodies, proteins in the bloodstream that fight pathogens and viruses. Their production depends on the severity of an infection. But immunity from COVID may only last a short period. The elderly show a significantly faster reduction in antibodies than the young. There's also evidence that some people don't develop immunity at all. We're still waiting for the science to see how long immunity lasts. In the meantime, some places in the world view it as a health passport for tourists. One little island in South America will only let you in if you can prove you've already had the coronavirus. My trip to Brazil's island paradise of Fernando de Naronha was completely stress-free. Actually, I had to do a blood test first. I need these lab test results for my trip to paradise. Here it says antibodies IgG 5.78. That's more than five times what I need. Even though I've had COVID-19, I'm allowed to travel. I quickly pack my things so I can set off the next morning. My cameraman, Juan Pablo, and I probably became infected with the coronavirus right at the start of the pandemic when we were filming. We were in Manaus where the healthcare system had collapsed. This is the only flight this week that takes off for the island. Sitting next to me is Carolina Sampaio, a businesswoman. She's been there 50 times. My life is starting again. Fernando de Noronha is the most beautiful place in the world. She may be right. Like everyone else on this flight, Carolina has had the coronavirus. We must now stand in line and pay an environmental fee. Strict rules for entering paradise. The island has been virtually cut off from the outside world since March due to the pandemic, according to our guide, Aiton. We're now the first tourists in what authorities say is an absolutely coronavirus-free part of the earth. One big plus, the beautiful beaches are empty. Before the island was declared a nature preserve, it was a notorious prison camp. And before that, a base for warships built on ancient volcanic rock. When the pandemic started in March and Noronha was cut off from the rest of Brazil, a curfew was also imposed. Only the fishermen were allowed to go out in order that no one starved. Islanders felt a new sense of solidarity. The authorities gave us diesel fuel. We used it to go out and fish. In the end, we gave away our entire catch to the islanders for free. Nanonia's crisis management has been exemplary. Thanks in part to random checks, the island has not had a single case of coronavirus. Even if more tourists come, we probably won't have a coronavirus outbreak. We've taken a lot of preventative measures, such as allowing in visitors who have already had COVID-19. They have this picturesque coast almost all to themselves, a privilege that, at least somewhat, compensates for what they've been through. I survived the coronavirus. It wasn't easy. Now it's time to make up for it. We have the island almost all to ourselves. I'll probably never again experience a paradise like this. At moments like these, the pandemic feels far away. But just how immune are you if you've had the coronavirus? Deepta Bhattacharya joins us now from the University of Arizona College of Medicine. He's an associate professor in immunobiology. 
What do your results on immunity show? Our, our results show that um, for at least people with mild infections, the course of the immune response seems pretty much as we would expect for most types of acute viral infections, where after you clear it, there's a certain period of immunity. Our study followed out antibodies and especially protective antibodies out through the course of about seven months. And our studies show, as have many others, that those antibodies continue to be produced for as long as we've been able to look. Is there any indication that it could be more than months, it could be years? Yeah, I mean, I, so when I say seven months, I don't mean up to seven months, I mean at least seven months. Um, you know, the pandemic hit our state fairly late, and so we just don't have any participants who are infected any earlier than seven months. Mm -hmm. But if you look just by parallels to the first SARS coronavirus, which is the most similar virus we've seen, um, you know, those antibodies, uh, people who saw the first SARS coronavirus are continuing to be produced now 17 years after the fact. I, I don't know if this one will be quite that long, but, you know, I think a year to two is, seems like a reasonable minimum estimate. That sounds quite optimistic, though, because other coronaviruses um, have shown that immunity can drop off after a year. Yeah, I mean, I guess the question is, what's the best prior? What's the best analogy? And so, you know, genetically and in terms of the nucleotide sequence of the virus, it's really most similar to the first SARS coronavirus. So I think maybe like the best way to hedge your bets is say it's probably going to be something in between, you know, a year or so, which is what the common coronaviruses induce and the 17 years that we've seen from the first SARS coronavirus. You know, ultimately, we don't have a crystal ball, and so there's really no way to take a shortcut here. There's no way to know until we just start to follow it out. Um, people who get the virus badly, though, have, have shown that they have more antibodies and they have them for longer. What, what's that tell us? Well, um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things that go wrong in the people who end up with severe disease. In the early stages of the immune response, there's a huge amount of inflammation and uncoordinated signals, the kinds of things that we don't normally see. Um, and so there's something strange going on. Presumably the levels of virus are higher. Uh, the amount of antibodies produced are also higher. Um, and so, you know, it's gonna come take a little bit longer for those antibodies to come down than people who had very mild disease and make fewer antibodies. You know, whether or not the people with severe disease will actually be immune for longer is something I think we still need to see. Because again, a lot of things don't really work right in the severe phase, and so it could affect some of the long-term antibody production. We just don't know. What's this all mean for a vaccine? Because a vaccine provokes an antibody response, of course. Yeah. I mean, I'm actually very optimistic about the efficacy potential of the vaccines that I've seen so far. So, you know, one of the things that we have noticed is that, um, you know, you get this nice uh, stereotypical pattern of antibodies and they settle in at a pretty low level. And based on the epidemiology we've seen so far, I mean, it seems to be protective. I'm sure you'll want to get to reinfections in a little bit, but it seems like pretty low levels of antibodies are still protective. The vaccine data we've seen so far, I mean, all of the ones that at least are being tested here in the U.S., um, all exceed the normal immune response to a natural infection. And so if, if the natural infection can induce immunity, I'm pretty optimistic that these vaccines will as well. Many things we still need to find out. How long will the vaccine immunity last for all and what are the safety effects, all those things. But all of the early indications I've seen so far make me very optimistic. Deepta Bhattacharya, University of Arizona, thank you very much. Thank you. And to bring you up to date, here are the latest data from more than 200 countries and territories on COVID infections. The numbers show new cases doubling in 39 nations and increasing in another 94 countries. They've stayed at the same level in eight countries. 55 nations have seen their new positive COVID-19 cases decline. Another nine are down by at least half. And six countries have reported no new cases for four weeks in a row. Here's the bar graph showing the statistics of past weeks. The fight against the coronavirus will be over when that whole chart turns blue. So it's going to take some time. Now it's that part of the show where you get to ask the questions to our science correspondent, Derek Williams. Does improving ventilation make confined spaces like restaurants or bars safer to operate? Because we now believe that aerosols play a role in COVID-19 transmission, um, at least 
in enclosed spaces. Uh, adequate ventilation would appear to be a key aspect of, of lowering risk in public spaces like restaurants and bars, uh, but also schools. Um, but what's adequate exactly? Well, that's pretty hard to nail down, but because we tend to spend longer periods of time in those spaces than we do, for example, somewhere like a corner shop. Um, the general consensus among virologists and airflow experts can be boiled down to um, the more outside air you can pull in, uh, the safer you can make those environments. So instead of asking whether improving ventilation can make restaurants and bars safer, it's more accurate to talk about what's called the air exchange rate, which describes the number of times that the air is replaced in a room over the course of an hour. Um, I read a quote recently from one of the experts on airflow who's advising the German government on, on keeping schools open that really opened my eyes about the complexity of this issue. He said, it doesn't matter how effective air exchange strategies are if someone who is infectious is in a room. The air can only really be cleaned if they leave it. Um, in other words, transmission risks in spaces like bars and restaurants can only potentially be reduced by air replacement systems. And, and even then, they have to be pretty high performance to make much of a difference. Um, but those risks rise again the moment more customers come and spend time in those spaces because the chances rise that one of them might be infected and shedding virus.